Hello, everybody. Uh, how, uh, how are you doing? Woo, All right, Yay. great. Uh, OK, so pretty much everything has been said about me thus far. So as, as uh, David mentioned, I, I do monitoring for a living, and we use uh, Postgres. So I figured the one thing I wanted to, to convey or share is you know, overall lessons learned um, in monitoring Postgres the, um, and you know, hopefully try to present some, some way to do it sanely without, without going crazy. Uh, my Twitter handle is there uh, if you have comments after. You can also talk to me in, in real life as it were. Um, okay, so uh, Postgres uh, did a dog last year I presented. We, it was a uh, talk called Monitoring 40,000 Servers with the Postgres Database uh, this year. I didn't want to present the same with just a uh, updated number. So we've grown, um, obviously, as a company and as a service. And we've grown a little bit our, our database cluster, but not that much, um, which is, I think, a testament to um, the solidity of Postgres and sort of the viability as a, as a, as a solid SQL database. Um, so who was, who was at PGConf 2014, out of curiosity? OK, maybe 20, 30% of the room. OK, great. Um, okay, so uh, this is what I look at every day. It sits on my desk um, on my immediate right, and it's basically um, what, how I see Datadog. So it's a lot of pretty graph and so on. And what I've circled um, on with, with red on the, uh, on the right is sort of the key metrics that I worry about, um, that, I, that I watch, um, that sort of pertains to our, to our Postgres. Um, Cluster. So there's a lot more stuff on it, obviously, because we, we have a platform that runs more than just Postgres. But it's still, um, you know, a fair amount of real estate. So it's a it's a central piece to um, I think to our to our architecture. For without sort of doing a rehash of, of the presentation last year, basically we use Postgres and Datadog as a catalog, if you will. So um, we we're a monitoring company. We receive a ton of time series data. We don't store time series data in Postgres because that's a little bit unwieldy. That'd be too much um, storage. It's just not very optimized for that. But what we store in Postgres is all the metadata. So um, if you if you guys are, I guess, is anybody customer or user? Okay. Um, so some of your all your tags. All, yeah, yeah. So you're in there somewhere. <laughs> um, okay. So now there's a lot of people here. Um, and I'm assuming you're interested in monitoring. No, now you may not be very excited by monitoring. So just a quick show of hand, who uh, really loves monitoring? Uh, oh, wow. You guys should come and yeah, work. <laughs> you, sh you should come work for us. Who hates monitoring with a passion? Oh, OK. Oh, that's good. Oh, all right. I mean, you, you actually should say, well, like I hate it. Doing it. Uh, then they don't know. Uh, that's, that's entirely possible. OK, so um, that, you know, it's, it's a, oh, what's happening here? No. OK, great. Now, if I zoom in, uh, this is kind of what I care about. So um, and this is, I'd say, handcrafted to our use case. So I care about whether we're getting transactions. That's this guy uh, commits and rollback. I care about whether we're going to run out of this space. And this is like game over here. So we have to come close. <laughs> Um, I can speak to that in more detail. Um, I care about our apps timing out because they, um, for instance, the, 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 the query is not returning. I care about locks on some very specific table. Um, I care about replication, replication lag because we use replication in a, in a read fashion. Um, and I care about it uh, a little about CPU because, and I'll get into that at some point, but we ran into some interesting issues with um, with sort of a kernel, and so I want to make sure that we, we don't have a repetition of that, or at least I can sort of have a shortcut to the, to the, to the answer if that ever happens again. But I think we're in good shape. Um, so the, what uh, I guess after you know, watching this stuff all day long, it's, that's pretty much as much as I can consume uh, for, for Postgres. So, you know, if there's eight, there's probably a few too many, but three or four at most is what I care about. Um, I don't really, they are, I'll show you how many um, metrics you can collect for Postgres. There are many more. Most of them are not interested, I'm not interested in sort of a high level. 
Uh, I'm interested in some specific situation, but from a sort of a pure day-to-day -day monitoring, that's that's enough for me. And sort of the 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 premise of or the um, yeah the premise of this presentation is that that should be the case. You should not have a screen. F well, in this case, you can have a screen full, but not have to watch you know, 50 metrics, because that means that you're watching stuff that you shouldn't watch. Everybody, everybody with me so far? OK, cool. Uh, I got to keep pressing on this stupid thing. OK. Um, all right, so um, it's not always been you know, happy times in Postgres land at Datadog. And that's not to say, I think in comparison with any other thing we use, any other data store we use, so we use Cassandra, we use Kafka, we use Redis. Um, and the, it's probably the one that's A, is given, given us the least amount of grief. Um, pro the, the only exception was probably S3. But you know, that's, that kind of gives you, um, we have Elasticsearch and so on. So we've had, we sort of commonly have, as the, the service scales, we sort of hit certain bottlenecks with every single piece of our, comp of our infrastructure, Postgres being one. And so once in a while, we'll hit a bottleneck. And then I'll go through the, the methodology that I'm, I'm, I'm going to describe. And then we'll find the, the issue. And then we'll tweak something. And then you know, things will, will be better. Um, so for instance, uh, so we're running on a 32 core. One of the, we are on AWS. We run of probably one of their biggest machines, not the biggest, but um, we've had cases where this is over the course of two hours where we basically bottom out. So this the thin, thin line is the amount of idle CPU left, um, and then the thick line is just a, a moving average, so it's a little bit easier to, um, to, to track, and you see that at some point for like a good 20 minutes, we're basically running out of steam. Um, so we've had uh, episodes like that. Interestingly enough, um, so we've had things that look the same, but actually, I'll get into details, are totally different in nature. Um, so where it's, you know, same thing, we're basically run, uh, running out of CPU. Um, and so running out of CPU when you run Postgres is not necessarily the kind of problem you're going to have, uh, because you may be a lot more I.O. bound than we are, and, but you could potentially project the same thing for, for I.O. metrics for IO stats. Um, OK. Another kind of problem we've had, uh, what do we call lockness, um, when we basically, there's so much contention on the box that just nothing moves. Um, and, then, you know, and then at some point, somebody figures out, OK, I found a way to fix it. And everything goes back to normal. So we've had that. Um, if you've been a customer or user, maybe you've noticed. Hopefully, you haven't. Um, if you've noticed, then we should have told you via our status page that, hey, we have a problem. Um, so it's, it doesn't come to a surprise. Um, we've had also this kind of stuff. So this is like a CPU graph stack. But um, just out of the interesting thing, oh, the colors are really awful. Um, well, so there's, a, for instance, this peak has this. This is a kernel time. So percent of, the, of time spent um, on CPU in the kernel. And this is sort of what Postgres does. So, We've had issues where there's a you know, huge imbalance. Um, and I'll, you know, I'll get into that as well. So sort of a bunch of battle scars with, uh, with Postgres, but I, I imagine everybody in the room has had similar experiences. So the uh, born of that was, um, I think, for me, for, for this year, I was thinking, well, what could I talk about? I don't want to, you know, uh, I'm trying to think of something that's useful. I was thinking that I could basically present how we approach dealing with this kind of problem, with these kinds of problems, because they, they turn out to be very, very diverse. Um, so, and, and I, I just want to define what monitoring is, um, uh, because I think the title of the topic is monitoring Postgres from the ground up. So for me, it's really understanding the performance of the system as it is now. Um, and that's, to some extent, you could argue, and I would definitely argue, that your, your monitoring system, whatever it is, is how you, you understand what's going on. Um, the other way to do that is to ask a user, maybe, how it's going. Um, there's just no other interface. You just can't go. Even if you're on-prem, you just can't you know, walk to the, data, to the cage, look at the servers, and kind of understand what's going on. You just see the lights blinking. Um, and so f that's why, for me, monitoring, I mean, it's, it's, it's sort of crucial. The crucial part here is understanding, and you have to understand how it is now, um, not how it should be or um, how, how it will be in a month or something like that. It's really 
um, there's, a, there's a strong real-time aspect to it. Monitoring is also dealing with partial degradation or total failure, and that's really the battle scars I was mentioning earlier, so you know, that's, that's pretty obvious. And monitoring, I think importantly enough, and that's how kind of I got to these eight graphs that, that I watch, is, a, is an iterative process. I think because monitoring is about understanding, and then you don't come up with an architecture and then you understand everything, all its performance from the get-go, you're sort of discovering things um, as they occur, as, you're, as the input changes, as you have more traffic maybe, uh, or less traffic, or different patterns, or different queries. Um, you sort of refine your understanding, and your, your monitoring, so let's say your monitoring system, ends up sort of encompassing, embodying your, your understanding of what matters um, in, in, uh, in, your, in your architecture, in particular, what matters with respect to the performance of Postgres. So now it's an iterative process, which means that, and because you guys have all probably somewhat similar, different situations in terms of how you use Postgres, what size, you know, what hosting, what kind of queries you have, um, you'll have different outcomes. But what I want to talk about is how you get to sort of a fast, not, or reasonably fast, but a good iterative process that'll get you to having um, just the key metrics to watch, and then the rest um, you can ignore for the most part. Is every, everybody good with this definition? Uh, anybody vehemently disagrees? Well, if so, you can you can do. Um, you know, please do. Um, what is not what what I didn't consider monitoring, which is capacity planning, is um, which you can use the same data that we'll see, the same metrics. Uh, you could use for capacity planning, but for me, it's, a, it's something different. Capacity planning is obviously all about forecasts. Um, it's, it's basically extracting from the data some kind of model and then um, having assumptions baked in and then cleaning up the data so your model can be used to predict what your performance will be either in time in the future or if you double, let's say, the amount of traffic to your platform, what the performance would look like. Um, so that's, that's sort of a different, um, different class of problem um, and thus the method I, I'm, I'm going to talk about doesn't, doesn't quite apply there. Um, monitoring, I would, I would argue, is relatively hard um, because the systems we use are complex. Now, uh, if anybody was sort of new to the Postgres world, um, they would probably go through these four questions, which I'll, I'll detail in just a second. But the reality is if you start using some new tool, some new data store, some new application runtime, some new anything, you're going to go through, um, you're going to have these four questions pretty much in mind. So first one is, well, what can I measure uh, about the performance of my system? And Postgres will get into detail. Um, second one important is, what do I want to be alerted on? So when, what should I watch and when should I be, when do I allow myself to be woken up in the middle of the night because something is wrong with Postgres or component X if, you're, if we're talking about something else? Um, that's a critical one. Um, what is normal? So what, with all these metrics that you can collect, you know, what did it look like when it's normal? And then when something bad happens, what do I use? And that's, I think, um, ultimately, once you have a proper monitoring system in place, and when you, once you under, which, is, which really means once you understand how the system works, um, you, can, you can answer all, particularly number four. So my goal is, you know, um, is using Datadog as an example. I want to present a sort of rational method for, for designing a, you know, a monitoring um, system, if you will. Um, I want to apply that to Postgres uh, in particular. And you know, overall, I want to share what, what we've learned. So this is really um, you know, why I'm here. Um, in particular, I'm not here to sell Datadog. If you're interested in buying, they're downstairs. But um, that's. That's, uh, yeah, that's so. I, I, there'll be some graphs from Datadog, but that's it. Um, OK, so let's um, talk about some prior art. So by and large, the ideas that I'm presenting are not uh, my own. I, um, I attributed them. Um, so there are three, I think, fairly recent um, documents or um, Ideas that have been presented, um, which I which I think apply um, very well and sort of are the backbone of, of this method. Um, they're all luckily available online. Um, the first one is uh, it's called My Philosophy in Alerting by Rob Ewashuk. Um, he's uh, an SRE at Google. 
I, I very much, if you guys are on call or if you have people on call in your, in your company, um, I very much recommend reading this. Who, who has read it? Okay, definitely go, go and read it. It's totally worth it. Um, number, number two is what metrics should I pay attention to uh, by Baron Schwartz. He's actually downstairs, I saw him earlier. Um, so that's a video you can watch. It takes about 20 minutes. And number three is the use method by Brandon Gregg, uh, who's now at Netflix. Um, and you can, this is, a, this is his, uh, his blog and his sort of website. So um, I'm going to kind of go through cliff notes, so I don't, you know, I'm, I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but really to articulate how, um, how to go about this. So my cliff notes on philosophy, my philosophy in alerting, or his philosophy in alerting, as it were, um, the idea is to really answer the fundamental question. If you, if you have, if you're on call, for, so I guess who's on call um, in the room? Yeah, so maybe 50, 30 to 50 percent. Um, the, the question is, what should I alert on? Or should, what should I get alert, you know, woken up in the middle of the night by? And the idea is um, to answer this question in, with the, the intent to maximize robustness so you don't miss uh, alerts that should have woken you up and you don't get woken up for nothing. And also, conversely, to minimize burnout. Um, uh, if you guys, follow, so for, for those of you who, who carry a pager, as it were, um, you know what burnout means. Uh, for those you don't, uh, be glad you, know, you don't have to, to face that. So in this case, is basically, and I've, I mean, I've been through phases like this, where every night uh, you're on call, let's say, for a week, every night at anywhere between 2 and 4 a.m., basically in the deep uh, phases of deep sleep, your phone rings is like something's on fire, and you have to, um, you have to react. It, sort of kills you, it kills your family, it kills, kills everything, basically. It's, it's death. Um, so um, what Rob said is there are basically two things. When you look at everything you can alert on and all that your monitoring system currently is collecting, there are two things. There are symptoms and there are what he calls causes. And symptoms are really things that, uh, things like the, the application is timing out um, and causes maybe 500 or, um, you know, some kind of problem for the end user. Uh, so symptoms are something that really doesn't, it's like, I guess it's like a disease, right? You're, you have symptoms that doesn't necessarily explain why you have the symptoms, but it's how you can tell if something's wrong. And so the symptoms um, are sort of very close to the end user and so on. The causes are more things like the classic monitoring stuff, um, like high load, uh, low, di low free disk space, you know, that kind of, all this stuff that you can get very very easily out of any machine, which um, which he classified causes. So, um, and the, the central message, and that's one of the key messages of, of first his presentation, or his document, but also, I guess, my presentation, is you want to alert on symptoms. So the only thing you want to alert on is symptoms. Um, so you want to alert if, for instance, there are no the database is not answering any queries, or if all the queries or a bunch of queries return with errors, or if um, if you look at a wider system, if you if no web traffic you know reaches goes past your load balancer or something like that, um, you want to be pretty high level. You don't want to um, and the, and the causes are more like how you explain the symptoms. So uh, maybe it's there's no traffic to my, or, or the queries going to Postgres all return errors, and the cause is, well, there's no disk space left, so the thing just is basically stalled. Um, or it could be that um, there are no queries returning from my database, they'll time out because, and the cause may be that the CPU is pegged or this, the machine is misconfigured. Um, now, the, and the, sorry, the, I'll explain um, why, you want to go in this order and not in, not in the reverse. Um, now, the tragedy of monitoring uh, out of the box for in most cases is that it, it takes the exact opposite. And the reason for that is that ca what's called in this case causes like CPU load, memory, blah, 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 is very readily available. It's easy to collect. So by default, that's what gets configured for alerting. And that's, that's bad because it's very, it's very wasteful. Um, and I'll show you why. Okay, so Cliff Notes, uh, I saved you maybe 10 minutes. I shouldn't have Cliff Notes for this guy because it's really important to read, but um, that's, so if, if you don't uh, have time to read or if you 
you know, don't want to bother, that, that's what I extracted from it. Um, Cliff notes from the second uh, document that I pointed out, prior art, what metrics should I pay attention to? It's um, a little bit, it's basically the same idea, slightly different terminology. Um, it answers this kind of the, the same question, you know, what should, I, what should I monitor, as in what should, what should I allow to be woken up by? So the, the message there is alert, so there's two things, there's work and resources, and the message is alert and work and not resources. So work is, consider work is what the database is doing. So the database at the base level, it's storing data, um, and then you know, st storing, updating, and so on, and then returning results of, of queries. That's the basic work of the database. The rest is just details. Um, resources are, for instance, um, CPU is a resource, memory is a resource, uh, number of queries that hit shared buffer percentage um, is, a, is considered you know, as a resource. It doesn't really do work. You don't buy a database or you don't use a database, you don't deploy a database so that your queries can hit shared buffers. It's just, just not terribly useful. But you, though you do it, to, you, know, you use it to store data. Um, so one way to think about it is, uh, um, is think of it as a factory. I mean, it's how 19th century, but um, Kind of that's how I conceive it at a very high level is Postgres is your factory, your machine. Um, you, you feed it with CPU, memory, network, I.O., and then it can, and data, of course, but that, they'll come through, through the network. Um, and then you'll get results out, you'll, you'll query. So the work is in the queries. Um, the work is not in using this. Now, the interesting thing with this, this approach of work and resources um, is that you can actually apply it to the subcomponents of of, uh, of the database, so you can consider that the work of the, the database is to store, to return queries, return them in you know in time, and so on. Um, now, each of the components they also have you know their their own factory. So um, the backend process it's going to take um, sort of it's going to use CPU and so on. It's going to return some data. The wall sender also you know it's, its goal is to send the walls that that's it i mean it's going to need a network for that uh, and it's going to need to read the the walls from disk so it's going to need some access to disk and so on but that's all and that's all it does so you can sort of recursively apply this decomposition for any metric that you're collecting so from any of these systems you can apply just the composition between work and resources does that does that make sense who's uh, who's not with me all right, I'll take that as a, as a yes. Um, so again, the key message, which is very similar to, uh, to the first one, is alert on work, don't um, you know, explain with resources. So do not, you know, I think the, the, the opposite is do not alert on work. Um, do, I'm sorry, do not alert on resources. Yeah, I get tripped up. So why, why not alert on resources? So here's, uh, Here's my graph that I showed you. So this is idle CPU, so it goes from 100, you mean the machine is either off or it's, nobody's touching it, nobody's doing anything with it. Um, zero is the CPU is completely pegged. Um, now the problem is I could set an alert for 10% CPU left, that's great, but it could be that um, there's a bad query going on and it's just trashing the box. It could be that somebody's doing some, I don't know, somebody uh, mining Bitcoins on the box and then I'll get the exact same basically the exact same profile. So do we, setting an alert on a resource, like the CPU is used, like great, okay, it's used, it's more a capacity planning problem than a monitoring problem. Because just setting an alert and say, oh, the disk is used, now I'm like, okay, but I still don't know why. It, maybe it's a good thing, maybe it's a bad thing, maybe this is a batch job and we are, con you know, I don't know, let's say um, just crunching some report for, uh, for the end of the month or something like that, or maybe it's something bad. And just, it's just not actionable. It, and so a lot of the burnout when you do your monitoring and you alert on resources like CPU, load is a classic. Um, it's you're just wasting your time because it's not, um, that's not what should wake you up. What should wake you up is the database is not responding. The there are no queries being returned. There's just a lot of errors. Everything's timing out. That's the stuff you want to be, you want to alert on. Because ultimately, that's the stuff that people um, care about, you know, be it your boss, your customers, your you know, your fellow, um, your fellow teammates and so on. Um, everybody cool on why not to learn resources? I, I have a question. I yeah. Guess I, you know, I've been doing database integration for a while, and we've always been more proactive in our monitoring. Yeah. And what I'm hearing you kind of say is it's more, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm seeing it as just you're 
something more reactive, waiting until something happens, as opposed to catching something. And I understand trying to trying to look at the resource utilization yeah. of server, yeah. but look at look at some like file systems and where they fill up. Ah, so, so yes. Yes, so I have one exception to the rule, and that's, there are two exceptions to the rule in my whole position there, file system and connections. Um, the, the, the consumption of resources, it is very important if you do, want to do capacity planning, so you want to know when do I run out of this space, or uh, if we double incoming traffic, do we run out of uh, steam in Postgres or, or something like that. It is not, though, no, go ahead, sorry, just Oh, okay. Um, it is not though monitoring per se. I mean, because anything like I do something with a machine for five minutes, somebody and I can trip the alert because you know it's it's that easy. One one thing I found is that sometimes like even with resource monitoring is tricky because I don't want to be woken up in the middle of my, the night because the uh, system went to eighty percent plus one k. Yeah. And stays there all night. Yeah. You know, so rate of change. You know, the resource situation and rate of change is also kind of an important thing. If it goes from 80 to 90 in 10 minutes, you need to know that. If it goes from, you know, 79 to 80 over the, you know, the course of the night, then you don't need to know that. You but can fix it in the morning. Even though, uh, you know, I would argue, so the, my two exceptions, um, all right, so let me, my two exceptions are connections and, and disk. Mm -hmm. um, Look, if your CPU is busier than usual, maybe somebody pushed some bad code, and but the the, the queries return in roughly the same amount of time. Um, I, you know, yes, at some point for more for capacity planning, I'll say, well, I want to see kind of what the performance looks like today. Uh, did we change fundamentally from last month to this month? I totally, you know, you should totally look at that, but not as a wake me up because you know it's now 81 percent and so because what happens is 81 percent so next morning I go okay I'll make it 85 percent that's a classic for this space and then uh, well just 95 percent and then then it's game over <laughs> uh, I've played this game uh, been burned a couple of times okay um, all right so that was another example of uh, the, the bug I don't something happens that this is the CPU graph basically I this is CPU, and then the sort of lighter blue is idle, so you know, the, the horizon, the capacity we have from a CPU perspective. Um, it look, kind of looked bad on the, on, the, on the right, right? It's kind of something is ma it's maxing out. Turns out, um, and this is, it has very limited impact, of it. it has a few more errors, but in the context of this particular application, it didn't matter. I mean, we, we get, anyway, these kind of errors once in a while, even it's fairly decorrelated from um, from from CPU, so I wouldn't want to set an alert on 80% for instance CPU because it would have triggered and you know nothing. Frankly, there's nothing to report. The, the the service is operating properly, so it's I can look at it maybe on a monthly basis and see well this is where we're going to need a little bit of extra juice if we want to keep adding customers. Um, but that's that's about it. It's not a real time. Tell me something's you know wake me up because something's wrong. Does, am I, did I sort of clarify a little bit my point? I'm, yeah, I'm back on board with you. Okay, cool. <laughs> All right, so the two exceptions um, are, um, so I said in the case of Postgres, I, for me it's mostly this space. It's a resource, but the problem with this space is when you run out, when you, when you have one byte left, it'll work, and when you have zero bytes left, it stops all of a sudden. And it's, it's, fairly, um, it's fairly easy to predict, so it's kind of, you don't want to get caught like, oh, well, yeah, we didn't monitor this space, because just do it. That, that one, it's okay. The other one is number of connections, because there's some maximum in your config Postgres configuration, so you don't want to run out, because it'll cause back pressure, um, and your application is going to basically degrade fairly quickly. Um, if you run out of connections. So these are sort of shortcuts. But in general, in general, um, I would say the resource or monitoring, alerting on resources, specifically alerting on resources, I'm not a huge fan of. Um, okay, the last cliff note, um, the use method, who, who's heard of that? Okay, cool, uh, a few people. So this is more, okay, so you have the difference between work and resources, right? So that's work is what's useful and resources what's consumed to produce that work. Um, so you'll get alerted on work. Um, so the database is not returning any queries, for instance. Now, okay, so now you know you need to look at it. Uh, the question is what, um, how do you go about it? So the use method is, is a systematic review of all the resources. Um, 
to identify basically the, the bottlenecks and the errors. So U stands for utilization saturation of errors. So it turns out you can basically map all the metrics you're getting into um, one of these three. And so having this um, taxonomy, as it were, uh, is very useful because you can, um, you can do two things. So first of all, um, make sure you've covered everything. And also, when you have a new metric, you can, you know, it's a sort of known category. You say, okay, this is this new metric. What does it really measure? Is it such utilization, saturation of error, or error? Um, and so, where you can apply use is for any any resource, uh, CPU, I/O, memory, uh, so classic resources, checkpoint or backend process. You could consider them as resources. So you can consider the backend process how um, how much uh, utilization is it? Um, you know, how often is it actually not in idle mode, and when the connection is not idle. Um, the wall sender is the same. You could look at errors. You know, how many errors does the back send, the back end process generate? Um, Checkpointer has its own set of metrics and so on. Um, the suggested, the cool thing with this method is suggested interpretation because it's relatively simple. Is you're okay when you have low utilization, no saturation, and few errors. And it's bad usually, and that's in general when utilization is over seventy percent um, because. In, because of sampling, that means you, maybe you, you run out of, uh, out of steam, you hit 100% utilization where your resources are entirely consumed. Um, it's usually bad also when saturation is greater than zero. Saturation as in things that, are, that your resource is waiting to process but doesn't have the bandwidth to process right now. So if things pile up for that resource, if the walls are piling up because they, they, they are on sent across the wire to your replicates, um, if, um, you know, uh, if the queries, if the if the PG bouncer client connections pile up because there's no backend process to uh, to consume, then saturation usually is bad. And errors is is bad. Um, it's more the change that matters there than um, than a specific value. So if you have zero errors usually, and something's happening, uh, then it's usually fine. If you have a couple of errors, but the, it's not increasing, then you're usually fine as well. I mean, errors are. I think uh, part of um, you know this universe is always going to be like some noise, so you're going to have some errors sometimes. Um, uh, but it's bad when you have a lot more errors. You, you have a symptom, or a, a, you've been alerted on some work um, metric, but your and your errors are growing. Then usually that's that's a good a good way to interpret that. Oh, this particular resource that I'm looking um, at has an issue. Okay, so um, this is sort of applying the um, idle CPU, the sort of the U supply to CPU idleness. So in this case, it's a measure of um, utilization. Uh, this idle is essentially a measure of utilization. It's I mean one hundred percent minus idle is that utilization. Um, load would be a measure of saturation of the CPU. So if you have a load greater than or per core greater than one, that means there are more tasks waiting to be executed than, um, than there are cores available. Okay, so all together, um, before we get into the sort of more concrete part of the stuff, um, so, so you alert on high level symptoms of work. Um, when you have a symptom, you just identify which resources is causing you trouble with that use method. Um, if you see now, if, you, if you've identified the, um, the resource, and it's not like just CPU, but it's something at a higher level, like you know, one of the processes of Postgres, um, you can look at, well, what are the metrics for this particular piece of component that are called symptom, and what are, um, what are the, the metrics that are more like, um, or sorry, what are the metrics that explain that uh, point to work, and what are the metrics that point to, to resources? And you have like this recursive approach to um, to uh, finding exactly what the root cause of your of your uh, problem is. Th does that make sense? Okay, cool. And then uh, you just stop when the high-level symptoms disappear, and that's that's that. I mean, then you can do postmortem and fix things and so on. But in general, that's you just go through this and again and again and again. Okay, so um, I think so. What I'm what I'm um, basically positing is that that little recipe takes care of last. Three questions of these four um, remains number one. Um, so in practice, um, this the source of things you can use for monitoring Postgres, I, I think, come from P, the PG stat star, so a bunch of them. Um, come from so, slow queries if you enable the, the you know, minimum statement duration, with it will explain um, that that helps. 
come from the OS because at some point there's some resource that is measured by the OS, not by Postgres. Um, and then you can add to it like Dtrace system tap if you want to go like fairly, fairly deep um, in, uh, in details. Okay, so PG stat. Uh, so I actually went through the page, I summarized, um, so you could go there and you'll, you'll see a spreadsheet. Um, there are 83 uh, what we call metrics, so things that, that you can, that, you know, um, will yield basically a quantitative value. Um, and I've classified them based on my approach. Um, so that gave me, I've classified as symptom resources of work, if you will, resources. Um, and so I found 30 for symptoms at different levels. So there's like symptom level metrics for the database, like there's no transactions going on. Transaction zero in database is either um, not working, not doing anything, and it's in maintenance maybe, or there's something bad because the connections, the transactions just don't complete. Um, and then the, they, they are also, I guess you can measure to detect symptoms at individual components like the, the wall machinery, the check pointer, and so on and so forth. Um, and then there are a bunch of other metrics for uh, resource utilization, saturation, and error. So if you go there, um, you'll see it's just a spreadsheet. Um, you know, you can comment, you can add comments actually if you, if you so please add comments if you, if you can. Um, very quickly, so what does it look like? So for me, if you look at PG uh, stat database, the stuff that I care about is, I, are my clients okay? Uh, and so that's at the database level. This may uh, actually may not show up in the, the Postgres like PG stats database uh, per se, but at the, database, the level of database, I care about do I get uh, errors in my queries and do my query timeouts? Like do my queries timeout? Um, so that's number one. So this is a very high level, like symptomatic view of Postgres. Um, are there any con transactions going on and is, is query activity normal? Like, and this is more, am I getting queries like select hitting the box inserts you know updates and de and deletes is that thing in line with what I expect um, there could be any reason why this goes up where this is out of whack but at least this is the stuff I want to be woken up not um, whether we use a lot of CPU or not um, for from a Replication also is something that I care about because of the way we, um, we run. So the, the two things in this case, the two metrics that I, I would call symptomatic um, or as a way to detect symptoms of problems are just the state of replications, is it streaming or not, is it running or not, and then just the replay lag, how far back uh, am I. So this is one of the queries we use for that to generate um, the metric. I mean, it's nothing crazy, just see how far back we are. Um, so the exceptions to the rule, uh, the two exceptions to the rule, I guess, um, the resources that I want to be alerted on, and you, I've set up data docs that will wake me up in case we either max out number of connections, because I know that immediately problem is going to hit us hard, or we will run out of this space, which is, um, even in 2015, a surprisingly common cause of um, crashes and problems. Um, so another, so these are the metrics you can get. The, for me, the key metrics are PG stat star. The rest is uh, we in the in the spreadsheet that I, I presented earlier. You could have, you know, there are all the details. I will use those when I'm investigating a problem deep down, but not. Um, I don't alert on those because I, I don't care, frankly, as long as the database is, is as long as the database is working, doing its work um, within the bounds I care about, then I'm fine. So slow query is an, another way to look at performance. Um, it's a little bit, at least in my experience, is a little bit different. Um, so there's clearly, when I, when I look at slow queries, when things are okay, what I do usually is uh, we'll have a baseline of PG stat statement to see kind of what the, ex, um, the execution of uh, uh, queries look like, how many they are, um, how long they, they take overall. Um, it's as it's a, almost a measure, another measure of utilization of my database. Um, and I'll set the menu, the, I want to log the slow queries, I'll set it to either the SLO um, that I, I have for my database, um, or some kind of timeout. So I want to know, or just under the timeout. Um, so I want to know when, basically I'm not meeting my SLO, or when the, when the client is going to timeout. Um, I don't really like to set it much lower because there's always going to be something bad. Um, you know, this, if you set it to one second, you're going to have a query that's going to take two seconds and it's going to start popping up. 
and um, it, it makes the log very, very full of stuff that you know, that may actually have no impact on the quality of the service. So um, that's why I don't want to set it uh, too high. And then um, I set it to explain so I don't have to explain. So that's, uh, everybody knows how to explain. Um, so um, slow queries, it gets harder for me to use when you have, um, it's still useful when you have a bad, like a bad plan, there's just somebody rewrote a query and it's just a, somebody forgot to an index or something like that. Um, I, it's, I still find it usable, but only to a point. Um, you sh if it's just one bad query, sometimes PG Sigma will flag it because they have the baseline, say, oh, this, guy, this guy's total time is just shot up even though the count of uh, number of calls you know, say an hour hasn't moved, so there's something different there. Um, and maybe in the slow query, I'll see that that uh, particular query pop up. Um, so this is a case where we have where we have um, sort of the sort of big queries, and this is the queries that we run are very um, sometimes a little bit uh, pathological. So you have this sort of it's a very very spiky pattern, and once in a while there'll be uh, there'll be sort of a an error which may or may not be caused by this, um, but it's it's kind of under the, the threshold that I care about, and so you know that's fine. So um, the equation of slow query, I can use a slow query log to catch. When things get bad, I find I personally find this, this um, the slow query logs of PGSAT statement to be completely useless. So nigh nigh useless. The reason is when there's a bad something sort of systemically not systematically, but um, systemically broken with the database, um, everything will slow. So it will slow down, so all the metrics will appear slow. And so your slow query logs is full of metri full of queries, of all the queries, basically, because everything's slow. So the only way of being able to work around that is to really focus on the minute I get alerted, is just look at what were the queries that finish just after that. Because anything after, you know, if, if if the slowdown lasts for 15 minutes, um, usually after a couple of minutes, everything starts to be recorded as slow. And so it's just not, I have all the queries of my system that show up in my log and I'm, I'm just wasting my time. Um, so we've had cases like that where you know everything slows down for 10 minutes, between 10.35 and 10.45, um, and the just slow query log is exploding. It's like everything is trying to, um, to, 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 you know, to be logged, basically. The harder case, um, is and I, overall with with the, the monitoring is when the symptoms are not obvious. So we've had cases where the throughput is still fairly reasonable, um, but just the, it's a little bit slow. Everything is a little bit slower, but not not you know crazy slow. Um, and but then you look at utilization. So you're it's more like it's you have that on the, on the screen. It's like huh, it's weird. You know it's. Things are fine, but um, but it, something doesn't feel right. Um, so it's the case, though, where it's I don't want to. I'm not going to look at that in the middle of the night, and I, I'm not waking me up in the middle of the night to tell me that something is wrong. And feel, even though everything looks fine, but the resource utilization is is high, um, is not something that my wife's going to like because in the middle of the night I'm going to wake up. And if I send an alert on that, I'm gonna wake up and like, oh well, yeah, something is not right. But I, I'm tired. I'm, you know, I'm not sort of 100%. So um, even in this case, um, you know, I found that that's the resources. I don't want to get a, a, a alerted on resources. I will try to understand why the, the system is behaving like that with resources. But um, I'm, I, I'm don't, you know, don't wake me up. So. What I've done there is like the use method, like look at everything. So, um, you know, resource by resource, utilization, saturation error, um, and just pull the thread. So one of the resource that we, we uh, I saw was uh, locks. So the locks were way out of whack. And so, okay, well, that's not great because in that, that explains why the queries are slower, um, even though the quality of service is still fine, but it's a, uh, it, it's an indication, so I keep going. All right, what uses locks, and then you sort of pull the thread, and then you 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 end up with a CPU. At some point, everything kind of ends up there as memory, CPU, I/O, network. Um, and then I have these. What, what I saw in this case, I have these huge spikes in kernel, and really off the chart. So, out of, on a 32, 32 core machine, we'd have 30% um, of the the CPU cycles spent 
running Postgres code, and then seventy percent running the kernel, the Linux kernel. And so, okay, you're there. And so now the kernel is my resource. And so, um, what can I measure? Um, to what are the sort of the key components? You sort of start diving into the, the kernel layers. And um, finally, we found two things which were kernel related, n not surprisingly. Um, so I'm ju I just put them there because if you if you have if you have a situation where you have high kernel timing, so person C person CPU span kernel is high, um, high locks, and uh, but nothing else is showing up weird. Um, maybe that's that, and I can save you time. We spend I think three weeks chasing after those. So um, in case it's helpful, there there it is. Receive size scaling, which distributes the amount of network, uh, the, the network uh, stack in the kernel by default executes on core zero. This lets, lets it distribute across multiple cores. And sched scheduler migration cost is just this thing where the reason why the kernel is so busy is because it's spending <coughs> time moving, moving a piece of a Postgres thread from one core to another core to another core to another core. The more core you have, the worse it gets. So that's sort of an interesting piece. Um, so with that, you know, I almost want to say that monitoring is not hard after all, but at least it's still hard, but I think we've covered most of the, um, um, we know which metrics are available, that's in the spreadsheet. We know which ones are to alert on. We have a sense of what's normal, or at least what's normal is uh, what it looks like when there are no problems. And then when something bad happens, how do you get, how do you, how do you go at it? Uh, and that's the use method. So um, the takeaways that I have uh, for you guys is um, monitoring is hard, but you can be rational about it. It doesn't have to be, it's not, a, it's not an art, I think. I, I hate that when people say it's an art. No, it's not an art. It should be more a science than an art. Um, you want to learn on symptoms, uh, and maybe you, you have to learn on symptoms that are outside of Postgres. And um, you don't want to learn on resource except disk space and connections. You want to use the use method to find where, which resources that power Postgres are causing the issues. And then you, last is you want to iterate, iterate, iterate. And after, when you go through, this, go through this, go through this, then you build a solid understanding of what your Postgres is doing, what the, what the application at large is doing. Um, and then that leads you to decrease the number of problems. And so then you, you can love monitoring. And that's it. Maybe that's the sixth takeaway. Yeah. A any questions? No one else does that, do you? Okay. Uh, so, me, me, yeah. Go ahead. So, oh, yeah. I was wondering if you could explain a little bit more in depth uh, about how you do the, the slow query logging or how you get the, the metrics out of it. Uh, yeah. So, it ends, up, it ends up basically parsing a log file. So, you can use. Uh, well, you could use, what we end up doing is we load that into another database. We, I don't want to log my slow query log in the database itself, right. but, you know, and then run some SQL against it. And basically, trigger around the window when the proverbial uh, feces hit the fan, um, just to look at what the queries were running um, and which one were running slow, and then that's how I would. Yeah, no, no, yeah, it's not, I mean, you could, I can talk, uh, offline, I can, uh, okay. you know, some ideas to automate, but, yeah. I, I just wanted to make one point about your replication library, query, yeah. which is that doesn't tell you if the slave disappears, if you're lying. No, the, there is a, there's no, that's why the other one is a state, and yeah. so, yeah, but true, absolutely, yeah. Yes, Thanks. Yeah, my, my kind of earlier question about rate of change, Yeah. you know, for resources like this where, I want to alert when it gets to 80%, but only if it gets there quickly. Yeah. Otherwise, I can do it in the morning. Do you have anything to kind of handle that? How do you handle that scenario? Uh, no, so th that's, then it's more like the forecasting aspect because essentially you want to know, do I have until the morning to fix the problem or is it, or, or don't. Um, I, I, so in data per se, we don't have at this point the way to do it. Otherwise, I do just a linear regression on you know what it looks like. or. The one sort of hack we have is 
um, we sent, so if you set a threshold 80%, I'll send you a little snapshot of um, this is what the consumption looks like. Oh, actually, you can alert on rate of change if you want. The, the thing is you, you have to alert on rate of change and also the fact that it's 80%. So you want to know, because if it increases fast, but it's just somebody's dump, you know, I don't know, do, doing a PG dump, um, and there's still uh, four terabytes of disk left, uh, and your database is 500 gigs, then you're probably okay. Right. I would want both rate of change and threshold. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's almost, it goes through from 20 to 40, you don't care. Yeah. Quickly. Yeah. If it goes down to 80 or 90, you don't care. Yeah. You no, that makes total sense. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Maybe. Yeah. Okay. Great. Well, that's all the time we have. So. Thank you very much.